So, I've been trying to sell my house for like forever. Because I was going to my new house in Canada I put up ads everywhere, even on Craigslist. One night, when I was sleeping then this guy, let's call him Mr. Smith, hits me up saying he wants to buy it, like, right away. I mean, I was desperate to sell, but this seemed too good to be true. Mr. Smith was all like, I'll take it as it is, no inspections, no negotiations. Just give me the keys, and we're good to go. At first, I was like, heck yeah. But then, something in my gut started telling me this was fishy. I mean, who buys a house without even looking at it, right? But I needed the money, so I went along with it. On the day of the sale, Mr. Smith shows up in this fancy suit, all smiles and charm. But there's something off about him, like, his eyes were too cold, and his smile didn't reach them. But I ignored it, thinking maybe I was just being paranoid. So, we do the paperwork, and I hand over the keys. But as soon as I do, I get this weird feeling, like I've just made a huge mistake. I try to shake it off, but it sticks with me like glue. A couple of days later, I drive by the house, just to see how things are going. And that's when I noticed something strange. There are these weird symbols painted all over the walls, like something out of a cult ritual or something. I mean, I didn't remember seeing them before, and I sure as heck didn't paint them myself. I try to brush it off, thinking maybe Mr. Smith is just into some weird stuff. But then, things start getting even weirder. I hear noises coming from inside the house at night, like whispers and footsteps. And sometimes, when I walk past, I swear I can feel someone watching me from the windows. I try to tell myself it's just my imagination, but deep down, I know something's not right. So, I decide to do some digging on Mr. Smith, see if I can find out what's really going on. Turns out, Mr. Smith isn't even his real name. He's got a whole bunch of aliases, and there are rumors about him being involved in some shady stuff. I start freaking out, thinking maybe I've sold my house to some kind of criminal or something. But it gets worse. One night, I wake up to the sound of sirens outside. I look out the window, and there are cops everywhere, surrounding my house. Turns out, they found a whole bunch of illegal stuff hidden in the basement, stuff I didn't even know was there. I tried to tell them I had nothing to do with it that I just sold the house to this guy who seemed legit. But they don't believe me. They think I'm in on it, that I helped Mr. Smith hide his dirty secrets. And now here I am stuck in this mess, all because I wanted to sell my house. I don't know what's gonna happen to me, but I can't help but feel like I'm in grave danger. And I can't shake the feeling that Mr. Smith had ulterior motives all along. I'm sitting here in this interrogation room, sweating bullets and trying to explain to these cops that I had no idea what was going on in my own house. But they ain't buying it. To them, I'm just another accomplice in Mr. Smith's twisted game. I keep replaying everything in my head, trying to figure out where I went wrong. How did I let myself get tricked by some smooth-talking stranger? And what did he do to my house? I can't shake the feeling that there's something dark lurking in those walls. Something that Mr. Smith brought with him when he bought it from me. As the hours tick by, I start to feel like I'm losing my mind. The walls of this room seem to be closing in on me, suffocating me with their accusations and suspicions. I try to focus on the sound of my own heartbeat, but it just reminds me of how trapped I am in this nightmare. Suddenly, the door bursts open, and a detective walks in, his expression grave. He tells me they found something in the basement, something that confirms my worst fears. I feel a chill run down my spine as he reveals what they discovered hidden beneath the floorboards, a series of tunnels leading deep into the earth. He tells me they found evidence of unspeakable crimes committed down there, things too horrific to even imagine. And he tells me they found Mr. Smith's true identity, a man with a long history of violence and madness. Mr. Smith wasn't just some ordinary buyer looking for a quick deal. He was a monster in disguise, using my house as a cover for his twisted deeds. As the detective leads me away in handcuffs, 
I can't help but wonder what other secrets my house holds, what other horrors are lurking in its shadows. And as I'm driven away into the night, I can't shake the feeling that I'll never truly escape the darkness that now surrounds me. I'm not much of a writer, but there's this one thing that happened to me and my girls that I gotta tell ya. It all started when I was looking for a birthday gift for my twin daughters, Lily and Rose. They were turning eight, and I wanted to get them something special, something they'd remember. So I'm scrolling through Craigslist, and I come across this listing for an antique doll. Now usually, I'm not into that kind of stuff, but this doll, it looked different. It had this old-timey charm to it, you know? So, I decided to check it out. I arranged to meet the seller at this little antique shop downtown. When I saw the doll up close, I gotta admit, it gave me the creeps. Its eyes seemed to follow me, and there was this weird whispering sound coming from it. But I shook it off, thinking I was just being paranoid. I bought the doll and took it home to Lily and Rose. Man, were they thrilled. They played with that doll nonstop, dressing it up, giving it names, the whole nine yards. But then, things started getting weird. I'd wake up in the middle of the night to these soft footsteps in the house. And when I'd go check on the girls, there'd be the doll, sitting at the end of their bed, staring at me with those glassy eyes. But it didn't stop there. The girls started acting strange, too. They'd talk to the doll like it was real and they stopped hanging out with their friends. It was like they were under some kind of spell. I knew I had to figure out what was going on, so I did some digging into the doll's history. Turns out, it had a dark past, a history of tragedy and evil. I realized then that the doll was cursed, and my girls were in danger. I had to act fast. I tried everything to break the curse, burning sage, reciting prayers, you name it but nothing seemed to work. Time was running out, and I was running out of options. Then, one night, as I sat in the dimly lit room, staring at the doll, it hit me. The only way to break the curse was to destroy the doll for good. With shaking hands, I grabbed the doll and smashed it to pieces. As the doll shattered, I felt the weight lift off my shoulders. The curse was broken, and my girls were safe once again. They never even remembered anything about the doll, or what had happened. But me? I'll never forget that feeling of dread as I stared into those glassy eyes, knowing that something sinister lurked behind them. And I'll never look at antique dolls the same way again. The aftermath of destroying the doll was a mix of relief and unease. Sure, the curse seemed broken, but there was still this lingering sense of dread, like something sinister could happen at any moment. I couldn't shake the feeling that maybe it wasn't over yet. Lily and Rose went back to their old selves, playing with their other toys, giggling with their friends, and just being happy kids. But I kept a close eye on them, making sure nothing strange was happening. Days turned into weeks, and weeks into months, and gradually, life started to feel normal again. But then, one night, as I tucked the girls into bed, I noticed something odd. There, on the dresser, was a tiny shard of the doll's porcelain face. How did it get there? Had I missed a piece when I destroyed the doll? Or was it something else entirely? I tried to brush it off, telling myself it was just a coincidence, but deep down, I knew better. That feeling of unease crept back in, stronger than ever. As the days went by, strange things started happening again. Objects would go missing, only to turn up in odd places. I'd hear whispers in the dead of night, echoing through the empty house. And worst of all, Lily and Rose began to act strangely once more, talking to themselves and drawing disturbing pictures. I knew I had to do something, but I didn't know what. I couldn't destroy the doll again, I'd already smashed it to pieces and I couldn't bear to see my girls suffer like this. Desperate for answers, I returned to the antique shop where I bought the doll, hoping to find some clue to its origins. But when I arrived, the shop was gone, as if it had never existed. Feeling defeated, I slumped against the wall, 
my mind spinning with fear and confusion. And then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something move, a shadowy figure, lurking in the darkness. With a sinking feeling in my gut I realized that whatever had cursed the doll was still out there, still watching, still waiting. And this time, it wasn't just my daughters in danger, it was all of us. So, there I was, just scrolling through Craigslist, dreaming about my first car. And guess what? I stumbled upon this vintage beauty, listed for a price that seemed too good to be true. I mean, seriously, it was like finding a golden ticket in a candy bar. I called up the seller, and we agreed to meet at this secluded spot out in the Bunas. When I got there, I couldn't believe my eyes. The car was pristine, shining like it had just rolled off the assembly line. But something felt off. The seller, let's call him Joe, seemed jittery, like he couldn't wait to get rid of the car. I brushed off the weird vibes and focused on the car. It was a classic, with sleek lines and a deep red paint job that gleamed in the sunlight. Joe handed me the keys, practically shoving them into my hands, and mumbled something about needing to get going. As I drove the car home, I couldn't shake this eerie feeling. It was like the car was watching me, waiting for the right moment to strike. I tried to ignore it, blasting music and pretending everything was fine. But then things started to get weird. The radio would flicker on and off, even though I hadn't touched it. The headlights would dim and brighten at random intervals, casting strange shadows on the road ahead. And every now and then I swear I could hear whispers coming from the back seat. I tried to convince myself it was just my imagination running wild. Maybe I was just tired from a long day of car shopping. But deep down, I knew something was seriously wrong with this car. I decided to do some digging into its history, but no matter how hard I looked, I couldn't find a single thing about it. No registration, no service records, nothing. It was like the car didn't exist before I found it on Craigslist. I started to panic, wondering what kind of trouble I had gotten myself into. But before I could come up with a plan, the car took matters into its own hands. One night, as I was driving home from work, the car suddenly veered off the road and into the woods. I tried to regain control, but it was like the car had a mind of its own. It kept speeding faster and faster, crashing through trees and bushes like they were nothing. Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, the car came to a sudden stop in the middle of a clearing. I sat there, shaking with fear, as the engine died and the headlights flickered out. And that's when I saw it. Standing in front of the car, illuminated by the moonlight, was a figure. It was tall and thin, with long, bony fingers reaching out towards me. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. The figure stepped closer, its eyes glowing with an otherworldly light. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, it vanished into thin air. I sat there for what felt like hours, trying to process what had just happened. And then, slowly, I realized the truth. The car wasn't just a car. It was something far more sinister, something that had been waiting for the right moment to reveal itself. I knew I had to get rid of it, to rid myself of this curse once and for all. So I called up Joe, the seller, and begged him to take the car back. But when he arrived, he just laughed and drove off into the night, leaving me alone with the cursed car once again. And so, here I am, stuck with this haunted relic, doomed to spend the rest of my days running from whatever evil lurks within its rusty exterior. So if you ever stumble upon a vintage car listed for a price that seems too good to be true, take my advice and run. Run as far and as fast as you can, before it's too late. I tried everything to get rid of that cursed car. I posted ads online, left it parked on the side of the road with a free, sign taped to the windshield, but no one would take it. It was like the car was bound to me, refusing to let go. The strange occurrences didn't stop either. Every night, I would hear whispers coming from the back seat, voices that seemed to echo from some dark, forgotten corner of my mind. I started seeing things, too, 
shadows darting across the walls, figures lurking just out of sight. I was beginning to lose my mind, consumed by fear and paranoia. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, couldn't focus on anything but the looming presence of that cursed car. Then, one day, I received a letter in the mail. It was from Joe, the seller, the guy who had practically forced the car onto me in the first place. The letter was short and to the point, just a few lines scrawled on a torn piece of paper. It said that the car was cursed, that it had been the cause of countless tragedies over the years. Joe had stumbled upon it by accident, bought it thinking it was just another vintage find. But the longer he owned it, the more he realized the truth, that the car was pure evil, a vessel for something far darker than anything he could have imagined. He begged for forgiveness, said he never meant for any of this to happen. But he knew there was only one way to break the curse, to destroy the car once and for all. I knew what I had to do. I had to find a way to destroy the car, to put an end to its reign of terror once and for all. So I gathered my courage, grabbed a crowbar from the garage, and set out to confront the evil that had plagued me for so long. As I approached the car, I could feel its malevolent presence pulsing like a heartbeat in the air. But I refused to back down. With a primal scream, I swung the crowbar with all my strength, shattering the windows, denting the doors, and tearing through the metal until there was nothing left but twisted wreckage. And just like that, it was over. The whispers stopped, the shadows vanished, and the cursed car lay in ruins at my feet. I collapsed to the ground, tears streaming down my face, as a sense of relief washed over me like a wave. I had finally broken free from the grip of that cursed car, freed myself from the darkness that had threatened to consume me. And as I watched the flames consume what was left of the wreckage, I knew that I would never forget the horrors I had faced, but I also knew that I was stronger because of them.